Hello, everyone. And we're going to bring this up because I know everyone had a lot of food. Yeah, you could go to hand clap, get some energy up. So welcome. I want to say back to the second panel. Uh, now, who was here this morning? Oh, wow. A good group. So what I would say first, let me thank the panelists from uh, Meet the Masters program from this morning. What I would say is a couple of things. One, I was uncomfortably pleased this morning that American Express actually can create a platform for transparency, even though it was a little bit of tension. It was some difficult topics that were covered, but in fact, transparency of discourse is what it's all about. Do you agree? Was that worth your time? And for that, I'm going to actually ask everyone who was here, that's why I asked you to raise your hand, to leave $10 at the door on the way out, because you would have had to pay for that if there was somewhere else. <laughs> pay extra for that, I should say. Uh, but seriously, for over 35 years, American Express has been involved in supporting and helping uh, the restaurant industry. We're incredibly uh, proud of that. We actually, as you see here, so you wouldn't forget, we're the, this is the 29th year that uh, we've been uh, involved in this. And it's just a great uh, opportunity for all industry members to get together, those who are leaders and innovators and uh, thought provokers uh, to get a chance to get them up close and personal. Now, yesterday afternoon, uh, we had the pleasure of meeting, and I had the pleasure of meeting many of you at uh, the Ajax Tavern, hope a lot of you were there, where we kicked off the program, had some great bites uh, from Chef Ashley Christensen, uh, curated wines from uh, Carlin Carr and Jordan Silcito. I think that was a really good opportunity. Beautiful view. Uh, aside, we're actually looking forward to this next couple of days to, again, get together, get some best practices, get wisdom that these panelists are going to drop on you. Yes? Yes? Say, look confidently. I'm making me nervous. <laughs> All right. Uh, but let me just uh, say this. Um, first, I want to thank the staff at Hotel uh, Jerome. They've done a terrific job in being great hosts. So wherever you are, represented in the room. I can't, we actually can't be here without uh, the Bolts and Company team. Raise your hand. So this is the only time that he's actually modest. He's doing this. It's, he's, <laughs> there you go. Uh, but now I'd really like to introduce, while you're here, uh, Andrew uh, Zimmern, uh, to host, who's hosting our second panel. And they gave me a really, really long bio, and I think we abbreviated, but let me just tell you a little bit about Andrew for those, the two people in the room who don't know about him. Uh, so he's a chef, a writer, a teacher, a TV host, a producer. You can see him on several uh, tra uh, travel channel shows, including Bizarre Foods with Andrew. Uh, he's also a four-time, not one, not two, but not three, but four-time James Beard uh, Award winner, a contributing editor uh, at Food & Wine magazine, the author of three books, a board uh, member of several uh, directors, and to just make an umbrella statement, a freaking overachiever, because that's not necessary. <laughs> but I'm glad to have you, Andrew, here. You do an amazing job. I'm glad to know you consider you my friend, and talk to you, man. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. um, because it plays, welcome, everybody, and uh, I'll, I'll double down. On all of that, we should thank everybody at the Jerome and Balton Company and the panelists and all of you for attending. Um, but our topic today is the way in which the hospitality industry drives positive change in communities. And a lot of times corporations, especially very large corporations, um, are on uh, people's enemies list. Um, I, I stand very proudly for for advocating that no one should have an enemies list. But I always like to take this time, and especially with the topic that this panel is about to engage in, to especially call out American Express, because there is a very large company that wants to support these conversations, that wants to support building community, that 
funds and advocates for more things than you could ever imagine once you start to get to know what the corporate policies are and where they actually put their money. Um, and I, I just couldn't be prouder of our, our name sponsor here. So thank you very much for having these, <laughs> funding these for so many years. Not just this morning, but hopefully this afternoon uh, as well. Um, I want to quickly introduce our panel, and, uh, and we'll learn a little bit uh, about them. Uh, to my immediate uh, left is Renee Erickson. I know I must be getting old, because when she opened Walrus and the Carpenter in Seattle, I went there uh, to eat. And I was just looking and just checking everyone's bio and just reading through to make sure that there wasn't something that stood out to me. And now she has like 17 restaurants. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, she is a, uh, a community driving rock star, many awards, an incredible book, um, and many uh, restaurants uh, in, uh, in Seattle. Um, to her left is my friend Jose Enrique, who has a restaurant in uh, Puerto Rico, in San Juan. Um, <laughs> many awards, many accolades, uh, but some of you, I, I hope all of you, uh, will recognize him from umpteen appearances on every newscast that I watch for weeks and weeks as Puerto Rico struggled to rebuild itself. Um, the, the very first place, uh, I believe it was the very first place uh, that produced a meal, a uh, community-driven, volunteer-cooked meal, uh, was in uh, Jose's restaurant once Jose Andres got down there, correct? Correct. Um, and <laughs> when, when, when I think to my, if I say the words like selfless devotion and uh, redemption of the receiver and community building. I can picture Jose Enrique in my head and know uh, that my definition is spot on. Uh, you, to Jose's left, and I hope I don't blow this because everyone blows my last name and I don't care, but hopefully Jen is okay with it. Uh, Jen Heide Heidinger Kendrick. It's that hidden end that we both have that well kills them. Uh, she's the co-founder and partner of Staple House, but also the co-founder and the spokesperson for The Giving Kitchen. Uh, and The Giving Kitchen, I'll let her tell her story, uh, but um, is exactly the kind of thing that we're trying to build and talk about uh, in this room uh, today. And down at the, at the end to uh, Jen's left uh, is Marcus Samuelson. Uh, I, if you think I'm an overachiever? I'm looking, I'm looking at these by now. We have been friends for like 20 years. Uh, so, I mean, there's stuff that's not on here, like, you know, things like, you know, you know, global spokesperson for the UN, his incredible nonprofit work, so many things that aren't listed on here. It's absolutely shocking. You do a lot of shit, bro. I do, I do. Um, yeah. And, and, and somebody, you know, that, you know, I, I was lucky enough to hear about it while it was happening, but when you talk about community and when you talk about business models, you know, lifting up, walking, walking away from a, you know, three-star Michelin tablecloth experience in Midtown, uh, cooking for one one-hundredth percenters, and saying, you know what, I'm going uptown, and I'm going to remake uh, a community through running a business, a restaurant, um, now many, uh, to me was one of the biggest put your money where your mouth is moves I've ever seen. And I've been around for a long, I'm 76, but I'm in TV. <laughs> so I've had a lot of work done. Uh, but Marcus knows it's true, actually, though. So, uh, so anyway, Marcus Samuelson down at the end. Um, so let's start with you, Marcus. I mean, the, we, we're, we're in an industry that has always been about giving. Yeah. You know, we, the restaurant and hospitality industry takes its name from words that implicit in them are, is a certain level of other-centeredness. Uh, and I was wondering if you could just talk a little about uh, the things that you do to drive positive change in the communities in which you operate, which is as far flung as, you know, from London to Bermuda to New York City and beyond. Well, 
Thank you. You did a good job of making the only black man blush. Besides huh? Gunther. That was a good job. Of Whoa, that. shit. You're black? <laughs> <laughs> so now we just as uncomfortable as we were this morning. So yeah, now absolutely. we're even. That's good. No, but I, 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 um, I think, first of all, um, I want to start with saying, you know, a lot of us, we go through this griefing period right now where it's very, very hard for... For me, and when you and I talked about it, you, you're such an incredible mentor to me, Andrew, but it, I couldn't be more better feeling being here with all of you guys and being with my community during this time. So um, it's a lot of stuff. I mean, our, our industry is changing a lot for the better, but before you have change, you have to go through this sort of uh, Renaissance and almost changing of changing of the guard and changing of mediums and changing of all of this stuff, and there's a lot of stuff coming out. And I just feel like it's we're not there yet, but um, I'm feeling really, really privileged and lucky to to be here with all of you guys. And it's not easy, and um, but um, yeah, I was I was crying on the street with Zimmer this morning, and he was hugging me, and um, yeah, that's really what a community is. So thank you. Uh, I, I think I think Tony believed in never leaving a gorilla in the room unnoticed, and I just think it's important for anyone who's not on the uptick that I, I think most of us, and certainly Marcus and I have talked about this, when it comes to community and all the great things we're doing, when there's an untimely death, and certainly in the manner in which Tony left us, has revealed a lot of fatal flaws in the way in which we do gather and the way in which a lot of us run our lives and everyone is uh, taking a moment to pause and do some uh, necessary introspection and some necessary reaching out to everyone around them to make sure they're okay. And so thank you for saying that, but that's, that's what we're talking so, about. So community for me, it, I think it goes back, first of all, to the word restaurant, right? It's a word that we throw around the majority actually don't know what the word restaurant means. It means to restore your community, right? So think about the, the very essence of that. And when I was coming up, there was only one way to be a chef. It was only men. There were only French or Swedish people with a bad French accent. <laughs> I was ne neither. And the people who taught me cooking was women. And then wherever I was going, whether it was in Japan or was in Switzerland or France, again, there was only men. So through that process, you learn that once I get the opportunity, I'm going to hire differently. Whether I would ever get that opportunity or not, but I would make a platform for people of colors, and I would make sure that at least I run a 50-50 kitchen with women and a bunch of delicious schmutz, right? So that's what this is. This is all of us, and we're a bunch of, and that, and that is the community that I sort of, when I worked in Midtown, that I wanted to create, and I was way able to create the community of one part of that. There's two parts of the community. One part is your tribe, is your kitchen and your front of the house. The other part is over the customer that you build, right? And if you, unless you have the customer, it's hard to build the other community, right? but they actually drive one another. It's this positive back and forth. We did a great job of driving the customer side, but it was not diverse enough for me. And I, what's your role? What's your role once you, coming as an immigrant, my, my role was, my goal was to get a job and cook and cook really, really well. Once you achieve that, you're like, what else? Do I have a role here? And you realize, well, the room looks you know, in the room, I stand out, right? And it was something that I was accustomed to growing up in Sweden. We weren't the only black family in our village. We were the only black family in the state. <laughs> so, so I was comfortable with that. So I was like, you know what? Let's not walk around this. Let's call it what it is. There is a huge lack of people of color and representation. I didn't feel Midtown was the best place for me to have that dialogue. And so moving to Harlem, between moving to Harlem and opening Red Rooster, it took me seven years because I didn't feel that I knew the community well enough. 
And if I'm going to represent the community, I needed to really do a deep dive. And through these seven years, I learned what an urban community looks like. You know, it's not a coincidence that there's no access to farmer's market. It's probably, you know, without being super paranoid about it, there's a, there's a plan passed and planned to that. So I learned that food was in the parks, food was in churches, foods were in homes without being called secret restaurants, without being on any blogs, but there was delicious food anywhere. So it was really with that idea and those incredible people that I met through those seven years, that then built Red Rooster, and then eventually built Harlem Eat Up. But none of that would have been done without having fully been taken back by this incredible community that Harlem is, and also changed the misconception of what urban America looks like. And the one thing as restaurateurs and chefs that we are, we are we're interrupters in the space. We can be positive interrupters in the space, or we can be negative interrupters in the space. And if we're positive, it will grow, and will lead to magical things, right? And Red Rooster would not be a Red Rooster without the incredible community of, of Harlem. And um, that is really what inspires our restaurant all the, day, all the time. I am the ambassador for that, but I would be nothing without the 170 people that work there, the 70 band members that come in, but also the 4,000 customers that we meet every week. Can I, can I ask you a follow-up question? Because you know, there was a point in your life where you were doing, I mean, you're, you're a global presence. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you show up in a lot of different places, yeah. not just with restaurants, but in your charitable endeavors yeah. and stuff like that. But there, it seems, am I wrong? You know, five, six years ago, you had your hands in a lot of sort of global mm -hmm. things. And it seems now that you've sort of laser focused mm -hmm. more on growing where you're planted and being really community driven and really intentional about what's going on in your community, is, is that accurate? Well, I think the, the, the first core, you know, when you're born in a hut, like I was born and sitting here with you guys, you have to work. It's always a comp, but you always go back to that. But also, I come from a fishing village, so you're no one in the fishing community without the village, the community, right? So those things are still, I know I'm far removed from that, but those are still the compass that, the ethos that I work on. And then, Part of moving uptown, I realized I have to focus on media and get the message out, right? Because a lot of people do great work anonymously, and that's extremely important. But if you're going to build a large tribe and actually have a huge impact on the community, you need this. So we focus on that as well. Uh, and I think when we work in Sweden, there's other needs, right? There the community might be how can we have vertical farming? Like a restaurant in Stockholm, we self-sufficient. So the farmers is a bigger part of the community. So we have our rooftop, not as a bar, it's actually a garden, right? So the community, where we work, we always work within the community, but the needs are very, very, very different. And they don't look the same in Harlem as it looks in Stockholm. So. Jen, um, can you tell people a little bit about Staple House and how Giving Kitchen came around? Sure. <clears throat> I'm suffering from a cold from last week, so sorry, my voice is a little haywire. So Staple House is a restaurant. I'm from Atlanta. Actually, I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana, but I've been in Atlanta since 2004. And it was a concept that started very grassroots um, and out of the home of my late husband and myself back in January of 2009, we started a supper club. Um, and it was a means for us, uh, really a way for us to get to know the city in a different way, to put ourselves out there in a very different way. My late husband was a chef and I had nothing to do really with the restaurant world at that time except for being a very supportive and loving wife. Um, and we would host dinners uh, for strangers every single week, full-time jobs. And that was really our way of, again, just getting to know the city in a different way, and getting to know the people who we would hope one day would frequent this restaurant that we wanted to build uh, called Staple House. We called the Supper Club Prelude to Staple House. And we spent about four years um, uh, working tirelessly and with every bit of energy that we had 
uh, putting, uh, putting our creativity and love uh, into this. Um, and down economy and all of these things that then take you four years later and you never anticipated you know, taking that amount of time. Uh, but it was, this was our dream. This was something that we wanted to open up together. Um, and it, how Giving Kitchen became involved was really off of, um, out of tragedy. Um, it was December of 2012. My late husband, who had never missed a day of work in his entire life, was never really sick, uh, was suddenly diagnosed with a late stage uh, gallbladder cancer, stage four gallbladder ca cancer, and given six months to live. Um, and you can imagine for all of us who have felt tragedy and who have experienced loss, what that might do to you. Um, we never had human children, but this idea of this restaurant was everything that we worked towards. Um, it, it was the dream, it was the child. And what happened after that was really our community support, and that's really why I'm here and why I have the honor to be able to speak locally in Atlanta and nationally, uh, talking about the mission of the good work of the Giving Kitchen and what it's able to provide for communities like our own, but um, the hope and, and dream you know, in the future is, is that the Giving Kitchen is, is, is everywhere. Um, it was a community of people. It was, thank you for that clap, that's sweet. Uh, <laughs> It was a community of people, our friends and family and mentors, who rallied around Ryan and I um, and said, let us help you, because it's exactly what the restaurant community does. They work tirelessly, they serve all the time, and they help. Uh, but there's really, I think, nothing uh, that, that this community um, that, that's the thing that we know how best to do, I think. And uh, this is exactly what happened to us. We were a very young couple um, and full of pride and didn't have, you know, we really had no understanding of what this was going to do to us outside of the fact that we knew that the idea of Staple House was never gonna come to fruition. Um, and we really just needed to concentrate on this medical diagnosis. Uh, it was in about three and a half weeks time that a, a team of about 20 people came to our side and, and again said, let us help. And three weeks later, they put on a fundraiser that we called Team Heidi, Heidi being short for our last name of Heidinger. Um, and it raised $275,000 in one night. Nice. And that was the exact moment <laughs> that we realized uh, not only was there nothing out there that existed from a restaurant and industry perspective, that was that backbone of support, that trust fall, that, that means to an end when you are either sick from, a, uh, from an illness, uh, whether you're injured, um, going home from work, and you're in a car accident, a bike accident, whatever that might be, you sever a tendon from a wine glass at the bar, uh, to the death of an immediate family member, your child in NICU, to your mom or your father who passes from uh, uh, anything, um, to a natural disaster, a family, a water, a flood, anything like that. There was nothing really available to us. Um, and that one single night is really what cultivated uh, what it, now Atlanta has been able to see for the past five years. We're a nonprofit that just celebrated our five year anniversary last month. And, um, and, that, and that was it. it was, we realized that a nonprofit could exist to take care of our own. And in that moment, we also realized that this idea of Staple House could turn into a restaurant of purpose. It wasn't just a restaurant anymore. It became, it became a beacon of light for our community um, and my family and our supporters. Um, and it became hope for all of those restaurant industry members who were in crisis. So The Giving Kitchen is a 501c3 that offers financial assistance to restaurant workers in crisis. And we also have a secondary platform called SafetyNet, which offers secondary resources. Whether or not we're able to offer those, that grant assistance or not, we are an organization of yes and taking care of our own. How Staple House exists is that we are now a for-profit subsidiary and have been um, since before we opened uh, a for-profit subsidiary of the Giving Kitchen where all of our net profits benefit Giving Kitchen. So you've created a full circle sustainable model by starting with giving first, profit second, mm -hmm. and that profit system feeding your absolutely the nonprofit. Sure. And and then of course Giving Kitchen, you know, has multiple paths of, of being able to fundraise and allow that that financial assistance in, but Staple House is one of those measures for sure. Jose, um, 
I mean, I, don't, I, I guess the, the obvious question is a hurricane changed your life. <laughs> Right? Well, I mean, it, it, they're, they're, I mean, you were, you know, your restaurant, your skill set, uh, awards. I mean, there, there was, there was Jose Enrique before the storm, but it seems that the Jose Enrique after the storm is a much different person with a much different agenda. Um. Yes. Uh, you know, it's, I mean, I'm a cook, you know, and when the hurricane comes along, and I've lived through a couple of them, right? We had one two weeks prior to Maria, and a lot of people didn't have power from Irma. So when Maria comes along, there's people that are already have, like, they've been two weeks without water, two weeks without power. And a lot of people that had kind of staffs or food, they didn't replenish, because then this one hit. So I remember, I was calling my friends, like trying to get in touch with people, and it's like, you know what, we have no food. And I'm like, we have no food, so I'm gonna hunt down, I'm gonna go out. I, it's my industry, I know all these restaurants around, you know, where I live, which is Santurce, which is where the marketplace is. And I'm gonna go find food for my friends, you know, and I start going, I'm like, wow, I can't find food. Like, I can't find food. Like, there's no food around, you know? Unless you had stocked up, you have had no food. And I'm like, I go into these, um, Areas, it's like Dominicans, like Dominican parts, you know? And I walk in and they're used to being without power a lot more than, than we are in Puerto Rico. You know, we, we live through it, but not daily. They go through that a lot. So they've, they've been accustomed to deal with this, you know? So I walk in, I'm like, yeah, we've got food. And I'm like, okay, what do you have? So I buy what they have. And they're like, all right, so you come in tomorrow at seven in the morning. We cook at five in the morning, seven in the morning. The food's gonna be done by 10. Everybody runs to those spots and starts grabbing food. And I'm like, so if I'm in this industry and it's hard for me, what about people who aren't? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, I have a restaurant. I'm gonna open it up, I've got gas. And I called all my friends. I did what I could. And where the restaurant is, where that's market, it's, it's basically people go there and Usually it's like, you go drink, you go have fun, there's music, but it's also a sense of like gathering there. So I'm opening up my restaurant, I've got friends coming in and everybody's walking by, I'm like, yo, I've got food, stop by. So that's how it kind of started for me. It's like, well, I gotta take care of this community. And I fed like 300 people, 200, 300 for two, three days. Jose Andres calls, he says, listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fly down tomorrow, and I wanna kinda of set up the same system that he had done in Houston. And I'm like, sure, come down. So he started cooking in the restaurant, and, and it's funny how it was just basically saying, listen, all this red tape, it's like, okay, there's 20 cases of water over there, but you can't take it. You have to go through some systems. I'm like, dude, there's people who need water now. Mm -hmm. So we just started buying things and just giving it out to basically like hospitals, um, communities, we'd have people, that, uh, food trucks, we would lift food trucks, food, and they would travel around Puerto Rico and send him food out. And it became to where like, okay, I did 300, then we did 2,000, then we did 10,000, it's 15,000, 20,000. I'm like, holy shit. You know, it's, we've got a, I mean, my restaurant seats 37 people. You know, it's a small <laughs> restaurant. It's like, how, how are we doing this, you know? And it was, I think, Jose Andres' feel for like, sorry, ham and cheese sandwich, right? Sometimes you would just get a ham and cheese sandwich, but it's like, no, 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 mayo, mustard. You don't want a dry sandwich. Come on, people, you know how he is with it. It's like, so everybody would get a bottle of water, fruit, a sandwich, but it was love in that, you know? And like Andrew was saying, like you change or, or it's changed after this hurricane. And I, I feel like if I was a masseuse, right? And hurricane came along, people didn't really need massages, right? They needed food. But if they needed massages, I would gladly go out and help. So it's just, it's up to me, I'm a cook. You know, it's, I think we all give, you know? It's just, I was in the position of like, I can help because I cook and people are hungry. So it was like up to cooks and it was up to our, I think also being in the hospitality industry, we love giving and it's like, it just fell right on, you know? It wasn't like, I think anybody would have done it in my position. Or I wish I could. <laughs> I'm my head you did. Too. Probably not.
Thank well, you. I like to feel like that, you know? <laughs> but this, 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 this is the key part of the question. We'll, we'll get to it in, in the second round. I'll let you think about it for a little bit while the harsh light of interrogation shines on Renee. <laughs> but the idea is that while, nice. while everybody has the want to, and everybody might have the desire to, everybody also lives with, well, I'm financially straddled and I have yep. my family and uh, I have a, uh, a bottom line at the restaurant and turning models around to incorporate giving and community support is not easy for everyone, especially for young uh, chefs and restaurateurs, for young entrepreneurs coming up to see the value in, as I like to say, you gotta give it away to keep it. You gotta give it away to keep it. That's a very, very important component of what this panel is all about and what you all represent. So I wanna, I wanna get into that little bit of trickery and how you model uh, that out. Um, and what I, what I meant when I said, you know, pre-hurricane and post-hurricane Jose Enrique is that I, I, I think that experience of Marie, unlike previous storms, <laughs> I mean, you live in Puerto Rico. I mean, there's a lot of storms roll through there. Not the last time there was a blackout or a flood, <laughs> uh, or the first time, um, but it changes you. I think you're a cha knowing you before and after, you're a change human being. I don't think it's ever going back to the old Jose Enrique. I think you are on, on different spiritual footing. A lot of times it takes tragedy, it did in my life, to get me to that point to understand the concept of service and how I could model that and how I could give and have it not still be about me, but as Robert always says, about the redemption of the receiver, right? Because there's so many people in need. So how do young people coming up in this community, young entrepreneurs do that? So think about that. Um, with, with such a big footprint now in Seattle, you know, what, what, what drives you in your community and how do you show up for your community? It, well, listening to everyone has been really interesting to like think of things in my life that have you know, my hurricane, so to speak, because I think I spent 14 years probably cooking and just doing that in a kitchen, you know, with my employees, loving it, not really having a big picture around, like, any impact that I would have or did have. And um, we had a really incredible experience with one of my employees who died tragically, and it was in a way that we all kind of just... You know, I'm, you know, it, you just couldn't believe it. And you, you know, I think, you know, there's always that time in your life where you're like looking back being like, what did I miss? How did I miss it? What happened? And, um, and all of that exists, you know, like in any experience, I think like this. And um, the only thing that, you know, at this point we were three restaurants and probably six, 70 employees, I'd say 60 employees. And I just remember sitting in Walrus that night and thinking, like, how do we save this person's memory, you know, to, like, make him not be hated or... Um, he did a terrible thing. You can, you can Google it. I don't want to talk about it because I'll cry. But, um, and, you know, because he was this person that we loved, and I think we can all sit here and say how insanely complex and sure. lovely our relationships are with our people. And... You know, knowing all of that, it still was this moment where I was just like, we have to do something. And so, um, and it, you know, it hasn't turned into this big thing, but what it did for me was it turned into this fact that I do have a, an ability to make a change that affects my employees first, which then affects the people that I get to serve all the time and then, you know, ripples out from there. Um, and so we started basically a few things we've done in our company. Um, in general was to kind of rethink what kind of company we were and how we, um, you know, how we employed people, who we employed, how we helped them. Um, for instance, with Cody, who had addiction problems, we started raising oysters um, and the pro proceeds from that would go to Recovery Cafe, which is an organization in Seattle. Um, 
and just tried to talk about it a lot and have it be something that, which I think is the hard part. Like we talk a lot, and we don't listen very well. So having this ability to have um, a team of people that were willing to really, really listen and really try to find help in that way for the ones that we cared about. And then, you know, all of us, I think, and you know, I, I, I don't want to assume, but there's, there's opportunity that comes if you're looking for it. And um, I think if you have the time, which is the hard part, I think, and it's easy to say you don't, but there's ways, I think, to have impact that is relevant to your business, is relevant to your employees, and isn't always, you know, a whole new job. And so I think that has been my kind of eye-opening experience in the last five years is ways to try to do things that impact, you know, things that are like in my, in my community, my neighborhood, my world, the waters of the Pacific Northwest, um, my employees and how, how they, you know, if they like me and working for me and how that community makes them want to stay and build these companies. So, um, we, in, you know, we have a hundred and, 20 employees now and you know every day it's a conversation of like what do they want from this company what how do they want to be represented how do you know what what matters to them um, this is like in person and anonymous so that they can like you know blast us if they want to and also and give us ideas if they're you know not you know not as vocal but I think for me like having something and you know it's, it, it doesn't have to be something tragic but for me it made me really stop and consider what my role was as this leader of this place that I went to all the time. So, you know. But we can't ignore it. Tragedy is an incredible yeah, motivator. Oh, man. And surviving it, dealing with it, gives you windows, uh, introspection, leads to self awareness that then can lead to a whole new direction. Uh, for a business that is a, sure. that is a for-profit business, but what can we do for our people, our community, and create a healthy environment mm -hmm. that could be a, a model for other people on how to run theirs? Because you certainly get the accolades and you have customers showing up. So it, it really sounds like this strategy created a real leadership change for yeah, you. I, I, this, yeah, completely. And I, I didn't really, you know, I feel like I started cooking when I was 20 and had my first restaurant at 25 and forever just sort of felt like a kid, you know, didn't really think that I mattered or had any voice or anything. And so many things I think have, you know, like blossomed out of like something that really made me stop and be like, what in the hell are we doing here? You know, this is wrong. And so, and I, you know, like it, it, it is something that the tools are available if you're willing to like speak about it. You know, I think, and that's really like the worst part, I think, is if you can be, you know, raw and open to somebody and, and have, you know, ask for help, which is, you know, the hardest thing. But it, even if it's like someone that you, you know, if you're not in the middle of it yourself, but you're in the middle of it because someone else is struggling, I think there's, there's you know, a duty to try to like, even if, you know, like I can't help Cody anymore, but I can try to help my other employees that are struggling with similar things, so. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, we're not perfect, but it's it feels good to have the awareness that you can have an impact. That's a big, big deal. Just on, I mean, just one other person, that's all you need to do is yeah. touch one other sure. person, right? And asking for help is is a sign of strength, not a weakness. Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorite spiritual axioms. It's very hard to get people to do that, but you Absolutely. can set up an atmosphere of grace like you have in your restaurants where people can give feedback. That's setting up an atmosphere of grace that creates change. And I, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs forget that it's not the grand gesture. It's not the grand gesture. Mm -hmm. It's the little stuff. Well, and we, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I, I think, Marcus, you said this as well. It's just like, I, I'm not the company, you know, like they are. And so it's like, if, if they want something that I, I would, you know, like, and most of them are 20 years younger than me now, which is terrifying. But, um, you know, like, it's a whole new world. Like, sure. the, thing, the priorities have shifted, everything's shifted. And so, like, if you're not listening, you're going to miss it. Mm -hmm. 
So how do we, we have a lot of people out here yeah. who, you know, maybe you're considering, how do I integrate some of these principles into my life? How do I get more involved? How do I get past the fear of starting to focus on other people and just not me or my bottom line? Because, you know, we, there, money is a big aspect of all of this both in how you're taking it in and giving it away, but how you're prioritizing and how you're working. So someone, let's, let's create a hypothetical situation. There's a young entrepreneur out there in the food space that wants to do more for their community. Uh, and I wanna save time for question and answer and all the rest of that because I want this to be a conversation uh, with you people. But you know, short form, what kind of advice would you give someone who came to you and said, I need to change the way in which we're doing things and I wanna be able to give back more and I need some help. What are, the, what are a couple pieces of advice you'd yeah. give them? I think you can focus on, first of all, I think there's a lot of strength in a catastrophe situation. And as bad as it is, you're going through that, then out came, like, I'm gonna give an example, like, Rebecca, uh, Film festival that is known all over the world. It started because nobody wanted to go to Tribeca after 9-11, right? So I went to Jane when we wanted to start, because I look at urban America as a crisis situation. Mm -hmm. So I asked Jane, that had to, she mentored me through starting Harley Meetup. She said, you can get 15,000 people to come, um, and you can get 1,500 people to work for this, uh, but it's going to take time. But there was a model there. There was somebody I could call up. I could call Jane. How did you guys do this? How did you guys do this? Right? So everybody needs a mentor in the mm -hmm. situation. I also think someone in my stage, you also need a young mentor. Not, you know, this doesn't change, right? The same three things you can control, you got to know what they are. It's community, content, and culture. And if you get those three creeks to talk to one another, you have a very powerful thing. Right? The community is your staff and your customers. The culture is something that we all care about here and you work on. And as a new company, it's very hard to figure out, like, what is my culture? And it might change, you know what I mean? Just like mm -hmm. Renee said, it's changed over the 14 years. Uh, and then content. Content, the menu, what we serve, or how you push it out. So I think those three things are controllables that you can control and say, this is who we are. This is not just what we do, this is who we are. I found a lot of strength in looking at African-American culture and the struggles and the civil rights movement and the roles restaurant had in those movements. You know, I think about someone like Leah Chase that basically went to jail to serve a room like this, but she was a risk taker and interrupter in the space in the 40s, and she took that risk, and therefore, you have this table. Right? So you do need interrupters, you do need risk takers. And because the restaurant industry, we're not, we didn't become a profession until 1977, right? So we, the, there was no one there lobbying for us. The good thing about that is there's actually not one model. We're still figuring out the model. So when these big corporations are like, we can't do this, we can't do that. Yes, you can, look at this. These are all three incredible examples that figured it out and now share it, right? So I do think that focus on community, focus on culture, and focus on content. And it will look very different for each person. Um, and then check that with a mentor, both a young one and a one that I've done it before. Jen, I mean, obviously you're creating something that you know, has national, international model implications, right? And I know you spend a lot of time talking about this with anybody who will listen. So you have a lot of expertise within your own story, but also in helping to motivate other people. So I'm interested in, in what your immediate advice is to someone who's looking to make a difference in their community with their business. I would immediately remind them that they have a major responsibility. And I think that's a lot of what we're actually talking about this weekend and uh, recently, um, and especially up here today, is just being mindful that we all have responsibility to help either uplift others, be a support, be an ear, advocate, um, whatever that might be. Um, I think it's incredibly important, for, especially for the younger culture out there, um, 
to, to lose sight of the, the, the real dedication that is this industry. Um, and that we, that we all, that we really do have a huge responsibility because it is one that is tormented by a lot. Um, I know from a, you know, our organizational perspective, it's extraordinarily common that um, while we have funding and we are constantly uh, you know, educating as much as we can to get the word out there about what Giving Kitchen does, it's, it's constant that we hear from both a front and house of back uh, perspective that, oh no, I don't need help. There's somebody else out there who, who needs this more than me or you know, my friend was just in a life-threatening car accident or has cancer. Um, my broken wrist is, is no big deal when the reality is um, we've really changed our dialogue um, and have said, you know, look at this as, as a way of being an advocate for those friends because we need you in the position to, um, to, to be that, that guide. Um, you know, it's statistically, at least for what we're seeing in our community, Giving Kitchen offers uh, financial assistance to about 47 counties uh, in Georgia. And, our goal by 2020 is to be um, an organization that offers assistance to the entire state of Georgia. Uh, so that's really very soon, in about a year and a half, and throughout the southeast, you know, a few years after that. So we have we have a huge responsibility uh, to get that message um, out. So that's exactly what I would I would tell somebody going into this profession: is you have a major responsibility. <laughs> With that kind of growth model and looking at so many other people around the country, and I, I, I look at other people doing this around the country a lot, that's a staggering growth model in a short amount of time mm -hmm. and an incredible uh, achievement. Is this something that you're looking to roll out in other states and looking for partners in other states? Not that necessarily Giving Kitchen is gonna set up in Rhode Island and Delaware and Los Angeles and Portland, Oregon, but you know, is this an open source kind of thing? Do you mentor a lot of other people in trying to set these things up? Or are you focused 100% right now on, on getting Georgia squared away and check that box before you start exporting this wisdom? It, it, it definitely is more locally uh, centralized right now. We, it is a matter of, um, you know, holding our promise um, and making sure that it makes sense for our community. Um, the goal to be um, an organization that you know fulfills this need all over the country is absolutely the the intent. I mean, it's, it's who doesn't want to be able to give back to where what we do all the time. I mean, whether you work in the restaurant business or not, you eat out and you have a favorite chef or bartender, and all of us go through crisis. Again, whether it's a natural disaster, or something gigantic, or it's something smaller. Well, well um, but everyone should, my opinion. Everybody can. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is that there is a lot of lip service sure. uh, paid to it. And there, there is not 100% engagement in our community yet. In fact, it's actually very shallow. Um, you know, Sitting here amongst like-minded people, it's very easy in a really smart audience, it's very easy to say, oh yes, everybody is giving back. But there are still people that are looking at bottom lines and others, I see it all the time, you know, you know, how do I get my own TV show? And you know, I hear that question all the time and it almost rings hollow to me. It's, it's you know, when I got into the TV business, it was uncomfortable. It, it was the, the, the huge amount of attention right away. I knew immediately I had to, and I had really good mentors, I knew immediately I had to spend 25% of my time and 25% of my money and 25, just, I came up with a model and I said, I have to give it away to keep it because otherwise it's, it's it, life's not gonna work for me. Sure. But that was really, that was, that was hard and I had to experience things to go with it. I don't think it's quite automatic, which I think it's so cool that you actually have a model, business model that can support this for those that want to do this. Sure, sure. And, and again, we are still, for only being five years old, we're still in, in a massive state of infancy. We have not set the playbook, so to speak. Right. We get calls constantly from Canada, overseas, to California, and then, of course, even just outside of our state, to say, bring this here. How can we do this? How can we replicate it? And the answer is, we have no idea how to do that yet. <laughs> <laughs> we are st we're still working on just our 47 counties, of which is just an expansion from last year. 
So, I mean, when you look at what, where we were in infancy, you know, offering those first, you know, financial grants to where we are today, we've been able to award nearly $2 million to just over 1,100 members of just our community. And when you look at it from a... <laughs> one, of, one of my favorite statistics is, you know, just in Metro Atlanta, there's 240,000 restaurant workers. And in any given time, there's one to 2% who are in crisis or in need. And when you look at that compared to either what we've done or, again, what we would hope to do, I think the numbers in itself are not only staggering, but just show, again, the need. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do when you go back to Puerto Rico? We have What's a your next plate thing? of rice and beans, mm -hmm. <laughs> hot sauce. That's After that, that sounds good. <laughs> sounds great. Medalla, a nice local beer. <laughs> are you? Are you? Um, there's still so much work to be done. Yes. Right. And you know, obviously, I mean, you know, I, I, I can't imagine because he's someone I spend a lot of time with. You know, the impact and the insane gravitational pull that the planet called Jose Andres has <laughs> on people that are around him uh, is massive. Um, are, has this changed the way you operate your business and plan on operating your business and what you plan on doing moving forward? What do you say to someone who says, I want to because I do think people are selfless. I do think where there's a, a disaster, people want to reach out and help people. You don't even think twice about grabbing, diving into the water to save the puppy, right? Yeah, yeah. But from a nuts and bolts oper oper operationalization standpoint, right? Because you, yeah. you can have an idea that you got to operationalize it. What are you thinking about doing? Where's, what, where's this taking you? I think what hit Because you're though, no longer just a cook, by the way. I hate to say it. <laughs> I, I, seriously. I mean, it's I know what you mean by that. I, I know that. <laughs> I, but I know it's easy. But the fact is, is that some things happened, and now you're more than just a cook. To other people and to yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Um, you know what? I think uh, what, I, what the most important thing is that first response. It's... Um, of course, everybody helps at the beginning and then there's that ongoing effect. But I think uh, what I was saying before with that red tape, it's just huge. It's huge, it's like, all right, well people here don't have food, they don't have water, and you've got stored food and water and you can't get it from there to there just because it has to go through so many departments in the government. Mm -hmm. And I saw that firsthand and it was a big deal. I was like, I can't believe it. Like, it's just, it was unheard of. And I think what I got out of Jose Andres, which he's actually, he started up a project where he wants to take it to, all right, if anything happens in the Caribbean, anything happens in Puerto Rico, it's like he's basically, he's got his battalions almost. You know, it's like, Jose Enrique, you know how we do it? You know the system that I roll on? Essentially Just, warehouses of disaster relief equipment, mobile kitchens, et cetera, et cetera. So they're not, we're not airdropping bags of rice into countries that are enduring a disaster that have no way to cook them and may not even eat rice. Correct. No, it's, I mean, this is <laughs> Correct. true. Yeah. yeah, and you know what, even, even and that's, that's so true because, uh, I mean, food is, is emotional, you know? And if you go through, your, let's say you have no power, you know, you have no food, you've been like this for three weeks, a month, You've got kids, you can't feed them. And then FEMA, right, it's basically dropping these packages of like military supplies, right? And you heat them up and you've got this food. And it's like, you know, these people are in an uncomfortable situation and then they're eating something that's like weird to them. Like if you can just, you know, work it and give them the rice and beans that they're used to, you know, and give them like the, the roots and vegetables that, they, that brings them that homey feel. It provides a moment to you sit down and you feel like, okay, you know, I can relax, I know what's going on. But doing like, saying like that rice, people who don't know what they're doing, it's, it's uncertainty on top of uncertainty. You know, and when food's the thing that actually kind of holds you down every day. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, it's the, uh, I had a chance to be in Zatari refugee camp on the Syrian-Jordanian border a couple of months ago. And uh, 
the largest business in a city of 100,000 people that sprang up instantaneously uh, with her, people who have all, 100% of the community is traumatized, right? You know, all the NGOs set up these food place, stuff like that, no one goes there. They go to the place that serves up Syrian pan roasted chicken and vegetables and pickles and bread. And it's the largest business in Zatari. It's the largest employer in Zatari, right? Economic models can come from that sense of pop-up giving. Um, have events recently, I mean, from, you know, Tony's passing to, you know, the hashtag me too issues of the last 14 some odd months, all the rest of that. Have you been thinking as things have gotten stranger and weirder, which they have, that, um, that you have wisdom to pass on to people and how would you go about doing that? Because I think you do in terms of how you've created your community and, and what you do, when a young person comes to you and says, what do I do, Renee? What do you, what do you tell them? Where do you tell them to start? Um, you know, I feel like I ask that question still to myself all the time. Um, and so hearing it, it's not strange, but um, the only thing that has made me not feel like I can't, like, because there's obviously like, there's a million problems to try to fix. And to, if you think about that, it's like, what? fuck, I can't do anything, you know? So if you think about like what you can do here or like with, you know, literally like the first layer out of your life and pick something that you know you might be able to have some impact on, start there. And I would say start small, you know, like if you, you know, we have employees that we help, you know, find them volunteerships for uh, teaching kids how to grow and Cook food, you know, so like figuring out what it is that asking them what they want, what they care about, what they're worried about, what what gives them, you know, sleepless nights, what makes it hard to, you know, breathe about it is and and help them find, you know, an outlet because there's so many places to help. You don't even, have, you know, I am like insanely impressed with people that like have their own organization, but that's not the only way to help people. And right. I think it's really important to think that even this one person, like you said, just doing something that has some sort of impact and teaches them a way to help other people is what I would say. Because for me, it was, I've, I've literally struggled with that where I'm just like, you know, what do we do? Like there's just, you know, like there's shitty farmed salmon everywhere that's destroying the waters. And then there's people dying of heroin overdoses and shooting up plate, you know, like, there's so much bad, like, okay, well, I'm gonna pick the ones that mean the most to me. And that's what I would say, is do that. That's great advice, that's great advice. Uh, before we throw it open to q and I, I, I just wanted to go back to something that you said at the very beginning of this that sparked an idea in my head that's not fully formed, so uh, I'll apologize for saying it before I do. But you brought up the, the French verb restaurer as being the word from which we get the word restaurant. Yeah. Meaning, you know, to restore and to make whole. Yeah. And we talk about the restaurant model in a sense as if it's a, you know, French, you know, Western European sure. uh, concept from the 18th century. You know, Japanese restaurants have existed since, you know, the 6th century. Um, runes at Pompeii show that there were communal cooking areas. I, I believe very strongly that restaurants have existed since the beginning of time. And the reason that I do is because of that word. I think the mistake that we've made, and what I would tell young people, especially young entrepreneurs in the food space, there is so much opportunity, but do not confuse the restaurant world that we know of 2018, where everything in general starts with a transactional relationship. Here's a menu, there's a price on it. I am, I am, it's, it's money in exchange for goods on the plate and services at the table or just handed in a bag over a counter. But in fact, I think the mistake that we've been making is that if we look all the way back into our past, 
Restaurants and sharing food with other people is first and foremost an emotional transaction. It is not a financial transaction first and foremost. And I think we have, we have a really engaged group of young people in our industry that want to do more than make it just transactional. Somewhere in the middle over the last 25, 30 years, we just got obsessed with making everything transactional. How can I grow 30 units? How can I get on television? How can I do this as you know, a me, 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 me thing? When in fact, our industry has been predicated on an other-centered basis since the dawn of time. That's the nature of the hospitality industry and that's what makes us a unique community as a whole. Somewhere in there, I think, is the wisdom, is the wisdom that, that we need. Um, uh, Sarah, do we have a microphone? I mean, I can hear people really well and I'll repeat a question too. I'll take off my glass so I can actually see people. Uh, Questions, comments, criticisms, support, deny, refute, <laughs> anything? Yes. Hi, uh, what programs do you have specifically in place to support your employees? The last bit of that to, to support, support your employees. Which programs, which support programs do you have? I can do that. Oh, we have um, 401k, a healthcare plan, um, they can, we have like a gym program if they want to. They can use the money that they can, they can bank it if they don't want it to help our employees with similar kind of, you know, like things that pop up in your life that are not, um, you know, foreseen. Um, that's the like business side of it, I would say. What else do we have? That's kind of it, I think. <laughs> Marcus, you have a yeah, big no, company. Um, I was thinking about it like, um, from a diff just from a different perspective. So when we, when we are in com uncomfortable situations, something happened and then we are transformed. And this is, you know, it's very recent for you, but it's, you know, I'm, uh, Andrew is right, like it's gonna transform you. And you know, something that CCAP that I chair and that I'm part of is really teaching young kids, inner city kids, we give them a school program and a scholarship to go to college. And, our donors really think that they're helping these kids out, which they're doing, check, yes. But from an industry point of view, so things are changing, right? CCAP is now in 11 states, and is actually more a hiring agency. Who wouldn't want to, in a, when we don't have enough staff anymore, right? Who wouldn't want to have a kid that has been mentored and trained, that says, yes, chef, and comes with a great attitude, has a real set program, that they can call back and they have someone like Richard Grossman that checks on them and the whole organization behind them. They go through college and then they come out with a job guarantee, right? So we have, when we started CCAP, we thought we did it to help this industry. I tell you right now, CCAP is helping the industry awesome. much, 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 much more than we're helping them. And, and, and I notice it because all the calls, all my chef friends that calls me, I'm really short. Can you open a CCAP in Detroit? Can you open a CCAP in Newark? Because, so it, it will transform. The other point I think with this was also about, you know, being, attack, being feeling a sense of attack, or being, being out there thinking about something. Like, I came to America, I love America so much, and as immigrants, we, we're deeply in love with this place, right? And we felt completely attacked by what's going on right now, right? So rather than complain about that, thinking about what content can we do to, to produce that. So, so with my show on NPR, on, on PBS, I'm thinking about, okay, we're going to immigrant culture in these incredible cities so people can actually learn about what we're doing in, in, in these places, right? And, and no one in this industry here in this table actually needs to see it because everyone here understands it. The people that I want to see it, I want to see two things. I want the US Congress to see it, and then I want them to take one week less recess and volunteer, <laughs> and volunteer in Puerto Rico, and eat food cooked by immigrants, and go down to Houston, not come with this like helicopter view, how we're gonna fix it, but actually stand there in the, in, in, in the mud, because it will completely, or work in urban America, it will completely change the way the industry has transformed me, 
because of that. If I would have this helicopter view, what the industry is, I wouldn't have a clue. And that's why these men, because they're predominant men, they're clueless. And that's why they will be unemployed. Thank you, Marcus. Very well said. Question, comment, concern? Yes. Lady with the great haircut all the way in the back. First of all, thank you for everything you do. Who takes care of you while you're doing this work? Oh. Um, Jen? Oh, my husband right here. I got remarried to a wonderful man named John Wayne in October. Coolest thing ever. That's really his name, too. Um, my three dogs, my therapist, um, and truly, truly, truly my community. Um, you know, I, we, all, we all have a choice. Um, I speak on this a lot. And my choice was to simply wake up every morning and get the hell out of bed. And it took a long time for me to walk down my hallway at my house and enter the kitchen that my husband cooked. It took months, in fact. Uh, and then I made a choice to finally go into that kitchen and use his pots and pans and his knives because it was a way for me to not only realize that that was a massive connection, but for me to get into the dark hole and realize that I had to fall in love with it before I could migrate myself out of it and then become a voice for other people who were in need. Um, so with that, I would say again, yeah, my support is just knowing the fact that I have a choice and that my community is truly my backbone um, and my way um, to kind of a full-fledged salvation, if you will. Who takes care of you? My friends and my family. I mean, they're always around. I love having them around. I love being with them. You know, there's obviously People in the business as well. There's that. Mm -hmm. There's there's that. Peers are always. You're always checking up on your peers, and mm -hmm. and it's it's funny how it, it just it just happens. You know, it's like one day you're just, how's this guy doing? Let me just call him up, and you end up actually stopping by or somebody stops by your restaurant. How are you feeling? You've been all right. I heard the business, or I heard this is going on. Like cooks, you know, we actually look after each other. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like even when you're not working it, it's working you. Yeah, I guess. No, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's part about of being in a community and yeah. why it's important for people to build communities of care around them, especially for people who are focusing on taking care of others. Sometimes you forget how to take care of yourself. Do you? Do yeah. You have no, a... I think Kat, your uh, your twi Twitter, Twitter, and Twitter. I'm like. <laughs> Your um, tweets are, have been really interesting for me the last few weeks, or a few days, I guess. Feels like a few weeks. And um, I think probably what you're asking is like, are you hiding? And I think that's um, something that I think we all do kind of in our own way. And I think there's a conversation around, you know, like the, the actual being honest about how you are and what you're, how you really are. Um, and I think uh, for me, I think it's a really interesting it's just the last few days have just been crazy and to, to kind of look around and wonder like who's hiding in my life and what they're missing or what I'm missing is something that I think about a lot and um, now I'm getting emotional uh, but um, it's you know I think the thing that I try to think about the most is is trusting the people that work with me so that I can not always be there I think that's the biggest gift I can do for myself as well as for them to like you know, end up running what I'm asking them to do. And so that, that time, which is, I think, what you need to not be a crazy person in this business, um, is, the, you know, to not hang out with my employees from 20 years ago, or just, you know, like, hang out with my people that are, that are my friends in a different capacity to have conversations that don't relate to the things that stress me out at work. And having that time is, is the only way, I think, for me to, like, feel, you know, the openness to be able to talk about it, because it's, you know, like, I don't have those conversations with my employees in that same way because I'm, I'm the person that they're coming to. And I don't want to look like a, you know, crying fool. I don't think any of them are in here right now. But <laughs> um, I think, you know, like that, having, you know, trusting them and giving them the space to, like, do what I'm asking them to do so that I can be mm -hmm. with other people, you know, which is often difficult yeah. in this business. 
Um, my family, my direct, my immediate family, my wife and my, my son. You know, I, I was struggling how to balance family and, and uh, work, and I, I was horrible. I am probably still horrible, but I'm trying. Um, but then I also speak a lot to my close friends, like Sarah and Philip and um, Andrew, and I was like, I don't want, like, with this specific guy, I didn't want to text Andrew, I wanted to speak to him. I call always Danielle. I remember when Charlie Trotter died, it was just natural for me to call Danielle. I called Danielle, of course, when this happened. So Danielle is somebody I just always, he's just always, always there for me. Um, and I can't, and then my other friends in the industry, um, Jeffrey and, and, and Alex, has got, like just very close, Aaron, I spoke to mm -hmm. Aaron. Mm -hmm. And we go back and forth, you know. So I think I'm very appreciative of the community, the, di the diverse community we have. So I go back to that tribe because that's my closest tribe. Um, Kat, can you remind people about the uh, uh, private, but open to anyone who wishes to be there, event that you have created tomorrow that is a what's heard here stays here uh, event? But if you could just let people know about that. Sure, yeah, and um, Andrew's gonna be there with me. It's for people who work in restaurants. Um, I run a website called Chefs With Issues, and we're a place for people to talk about mental health. Um, so it's tomorrow from 12.30 to 1.45. What happens, that room stays in that room. No press, no tweets, no nothing out of there. Just a bunch of people coming together to support each other and figure out how to move forward in, in joy and, and support and health. And um, if they want to send me a note about it, because I don't remember the name of the menu. Um, great. Our Sarah Ken, um, I'm Kat, K-A-T, at chefswithissues.com, and I'll send you the information and the RSVP link. That's Kat, K-A-T, <laughs> at chefswithissues.com, <laughs> and we will share the address of the Bat Cave uh, for tomorrow, which will be very inspiring and joyful. Question, comment? Yes, ma'am? Sorry, you look like a man. Oh, thank God it is. Thank you, Marcus. Hi, how are you? Um, and I was just gonna say, don't feel bad, Renee, because I think I've cried four times since oh, I've gotten here. Know. I'm blaming it on the altitude. Um, I wanted to ask you, actually, um, my restaurants are in DC, where the battle against changing the traditional tip system is well underway. We have a big vote on Tuesday. Um, about whether we're going to eliminate the tip credit, which allows restaurant owners to tip under minimum wage as long as, excuse me, I'm like out of breath, altitude, I'm telling you, um, as long as tips make up for, for the employee's um, lower base pay. So we as restaurant owners definitely did big group meetings with our employees beforehand, especially our front of house um, community. And the feedback was across the board, we do not want this, we want to keep the system the way it is, we make well over minimum wage, we want to keep it that way. Um, so as restaurant owners, overwhelmingly, we are speaking out against changing the system. I know in Seattle, um, it has changed to the base rate of $15 per yeah. hour, I think. Yeah. And, I, and I have read some of the things that you've done on it. So I am curious how that's working, if you still, still feel the same about it once it was enacted. Um, any feedback on that? Because I think it's yeah. an issue around the country, so. Before you answer that, yes, sir. is this, no, 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 can, can you hold the microphone for her? I just want to, I just want to clarify, um, is this a fear of financial security issue, um, an HR issue in a sense with your employees in terms of keeping them enrolled uh, and happy or both? I'm just curious. Sure, yeah, I just, I didn't want to speak too much. <laughs> um, but it's it's both. I think okay. we wanted to represent the workers. Right. Um, and they like the system, so we're doing it. But it, just very honestly, of course, from the, from the owner's standpoint, we have projections over 10, 20 years based on the system the way it is. So yeah, of course it's frightening. No, I mean, I mean of course it's in that a lot of people live in, in, in our business, a penny's business, always then associate what has to be cut away and usually it's the giving. So it relates to what our topic is on many, many different levels. And thank you for sharing that. I appreciate the clarification. 
You have experience with um, this. Yeah, I mean, being afraid's good. Um, I think listening to your employees' fears good and trying to get them to buy, you know, they have to be on board, I think, otherwise it won't work for you. We've been, we have a, how do we call it now? A, a ser service charge, I'm like, blah. But when we've, so it's, we're four years into over, well, we already pay people over $15 an hour prior to the, tip, the, the minimum wage in Seattle. Um, but when that was happening and Obamacare and other things in our company that we were trying to implement, it seemed like a good time for us to kind of address all of those issues at the same time and remove tipping um, and add a service charge. And a lot of that was, um, we all know that the back and the front of the house in America is like skewed dramatically in pay. And that, being a cook, just like, the more I looked into it, the more I was mad because it's just yeah. like, what the hell? You know, not that servers don't work really hard, but cooks, they work their tails off. And um, for like le more than half of what servers make, less than half, yeah. And so coupled with that, if, if our entire industry was gonna get bumped from minimum wage in Seattle, I think it was 10 at the time, to 15, so all of my servers were gonna get a $5 an hour raise, which didn't help anything. You know, it just made them make more money and made the disparity greater and more frustration and all of that. And so the, all, of, all of these components made us, and, and on top of it, all the issues around tipping in general, which is gross um, and unfair and uncomfortable and just wrong, you know, you don't tip your tire guy, you don't tip your dentist, you don't tip almost anyone. And for some reason, we still tip for, you know, a Coke at a table versus, you know, a Coke not at a table, you know, it's just dumb. Um, <clears throat> and so, we, we went in ahead and did it. And it was that, that conversation where I was just like, lots of lots of meetings with our staff and trying to get them to read historically like why tipping existed and where it's come and why we're kind of, we're the last you know, frontier for it. And, um, and it's been great. I mean, it costs your company more money, absolutely. Um, there are you know, ongoing conversations because our employees four years ago are not the same employees altogether now, so you know we've learned that we have to have the same kind of like, you know, are you on our train? You know, like, do you want to, you know, like, be a part of this thing that we're trying to do, or not, and make it make sense because it's confusing because you know the restaurant next door doesn't have it and they make more money sometimes if they give them free drinks and they get like a forty dollar or forty percent tip. So um, there's a whole mess of issues around it, but. We're really happy with it, and we still have conversations all the time in our ownership group um, and with our employees. And you know, we still get probably five percent in our anonymous surveys about like, well, can't you just add a tip line? And we won't do that. Um, we do ask that people, if they get cash, that we don't want to know about it, and that um, we prefer them to donate it to the charities that our company supports. And that's driven by our employees; they get to choose you know, where we give money, we like kind of re-up it every year. Um, so it's, you know, it's not easy. I think it's a really great thing. I think, um, yeah, I mean, I hope it's the future for our industry. Absolutely. Did that help at all? <laughs> <laughs> help, <Yeah>. help me. <laughs> uh, I've been told we don't have time for any more questions. So of course that means we can take one last question. Uh, <laughs> Um, after this, um, Jose and Renee are cooking out in the ballrooms. Correct. Or, excuse, the garden terrace. So I've just got an SOS that we need one of the chefs out. Who's our last question? I guess it's Renee. <laughs> <laughs> She's in trouble. All right. It's what happens when you're a cook, right? Yes. <laughs> oh, shit. Pleasure being here. Thank you, Jose. Fire away. Uh, my name is Kate. I work in Central. By the way, there was a need, and a cook has rushed <laughs> to fill the void. So I have a catering business in Central Texas. Can you hold that up a little closer? Catering business in yep. Central Texas. I have uh, also co-partnered in a nonprofit, kind of geared towards education of 
a younger generation as far as food service and everything that's involved in that. I'm curious your, all of your opinion on uh, how you would get a younger generation engaged in that. What's the, what's the beginning? How do you kick that off? Uh, well, I, I think our industry is very exciting and it offers a lot. It offers camaraderie, and it offers in emotional connections that you can, it can be a bridge to you, whatever the next is. But I think I've never had an issue to engage young people because there's so many moving parts in our industry. Um, so I think whether it starts back of the house um, or front of the house, but it's probably easier sometimes to start it back of the house, it can be hands on in a different way. But I think that doing cooking classes and really teaching about very simple things, how to cook, which is something that you don't have to become a chef to, which is an important tool, right? It's like a language. Uh, just as important as coding, probably even more. Um, and then also teaching about simple things about taste, which I think not only young people don't know that we can all experience sweet, sour, salt, bitter, heat, and umame, this is every single person, whatever age. So I think there's so much there, and just engage in that. It doesn't have to be for 40 people, or 30 can be for 10 or five. So I, said, well, I would start with that, though you don't think you can control. Taking them to the farmer's market, or how does stuff grow? Like, young people want to get engaged, especially a generation that comes out with so much technology. So learning about how do you up your um, social compass, I think it's in cooking and our industry is an excellent example about those opportunities. And that is not just need for inner city poor kids. That's an emotional connection is for everyone, very democratic. Jen, yeah. how do you do it? I was gonna say, you know, to ask for engagement means you have to show engagement and you have to dive in. Um, <laughs> You know, at least us at, at Staple House, we're a very small business. We have 32 seats in our dining room, um, and we have 26 teammates uh, total. And it is very frequent that I will work dish and to show my engagement and the reality of what it takes. Um, nice. In fact, we rotate our dish position from our back and our front of house teammates, and so we don't even really have a dishwasher except for when you're in that position. Um, so I, I, again, I just think it's a matter of um, having the ability to have an open door policy, um, to sit down with your staff um, day in and day out, um, engage in family meal together, you know, engage in off service subjects and topics in lineup. Um, it's really, it's showing what, why you are here, why you started this business, you know, at the, from the very beginning is, it wasn't about, it's not about really making money, it's about service and it's about, you know, giving, giving back. That's the hope, um, so. I'm, I'm not sure, is it young, what's the age group that you're working with? Or is it like all? Oh, you can get, just yeah. holler at me. What's the age group? <laughs> Uh, well, our summer camp that we run during the summer is uh, four, sorry, nine to fourteen, and then the rest of the year is pretty open spectrum. Awesome. We have schools from all over the country come. We have schools from our community come, but as far as age range, we've gone in from little bitty guys to high school. Okay, there's a, a organization that. Um, my husband's on the panel of, and we do a lot of work with in Seattle called Green Plate Special. Do you know, okay, so I was gonna say like that, for me it was like the most like amazing experience to like be a part of and having, um, and they're like nine to 13 I think for the most part, and then they have like uh, counselors that come back, which is really awesome. But they have a farmer's market that they do, and uh, that, I mean I wish I was a kid going to that. I was so impressed by it, and I think, they do outreach into all the schools and, and plant gardens and um, I don't know, it, it's just teaching kids about food and taste and having it be, um, you know, simple, not like some like TV show like Whiz Bang thing, but like cooking beans or, you know, yeah. like how to grill a pepper. I think there's like simple things that kids can like do, you know, making it attainable rather than, than this, you know, 
difficult thing seems the most, but you, you know Lara and the, the group there at Green Plate? Awesome. Thank you very much. Cool. Great question. Thank you, American Express. Thank you, Bolts and Company. Yeah. Thank you, Hotel Jerome. Thank you to uh, Jose and Marcus and Jen and Renee. And please join us all out in the garden, which you can't miss. It's that beautiful alley space uh, just to the west of us. Uh, see you all there. Thank you. Thank you.